late 19th and early 20th centuries were the great era of the world's fairs or exhibitions. They were held in the great cities of Europe and North America. They were essentially trade fairs for focusing on the products of the colonies. Although they were primarily commercial, they served other purposes too. They were spectacular displays of imperial power, and they also introduced what we now call first world publics to the material and performing arts of the third world. Music played a prominent role in this, and in the days before recording, many West musicians first encountered non-Western musics at the world's fairs. In particular, the Exposition Universelle, or Universal Expo uh, Exhibitions, that were held in Paris during uh, 18, 19, 1889 and 1900. In particular, these were the site of the most famous of all such encounters when Debussy first heard the Japanese gamelan. It's a an encounter that has attracted a lot of attention from musicologists. Already in her 2005 book, Musical Encounters at the 1889 Paris World's Fair, which is my most important source for this paper, Anna Gret Fauser entitled her discussion of the topic, Once Again, Debussy and the Gamelan. So it might seem unnecessary to give this much disturbed song yet another term, but I hope to have something fresh to say. Now, the reason that musicologists are interested in Debussy's encounter with the Gamelan is, of course, that it's seen as having had a crucial influence on his musical, his compositional style. So, ideas of encounter and ideas of influence are tied up with one another. And musicologists who have written about Debussy and the Gamelan have generally been concerned to draw a highly value-laden distinction between two kinds of influence, one seen as good and the other seen as bad. At the bad end of the scale, we have what the pianist Paul Roberts refers to as pastiche orientalism, the pasting of stereotyped local elements onto an essentially unmodified Western style in the manner of the 19th century exoticism that's been very strongly critiqued by this post-colonial theory. At the good end of the scale, we have the deep assimilation of Javanese musical principles into Debussy's style that the pianist and musicologist Roy Howard refers to as the essence of a really profound and creative influence, a kind of negotiation between self and other that gives rise to what is seen as authentically transcultural composition. For the highly influential Chinese-American composer Chou Wen Chou, Debussy's exposure to the Indonesian gamelan was catalytic in evolving his new concepts. Well, what is it that enabled Debussy to respond to the gamelan in the creative way that he did? rethinking fundamental premises of the Western musical tradition rather than simply plastering cheap imitations of oriental characteristics onto it. The usual answer to this is because he was musically and conceptually prepared for it. For the musicologist Mervyn Cook, the experience intensified techniques that were already latent in his music and that stood apart from the conventional and soon to be outmoded procedures that had dominated Central European tonal music for the previous 200 years. Cook explains that the affinities between Debussy and the Gamelan include scale types, ostinati, polyphonic textures, and sonorities, all of which were embodied in Debussy's developing style before his first encounter with the Japanese musicians. And the ethnomusicologist and gamelan specialist Neil Sorrell uses the same approach to critique the very idea of influence. It could be argued, he said, that Debussy's best music shows no influence of Japanese gamelan at all. The key word is influence, with its suggestion of bringing around a change of course. With Debussy, a much more fruitful word would be confirmation. It seems far more plausible that what he heard in 1889 confirmed what he had at least subconsciously always felt about music, and that this experience went far deeper than a desire to imitate something new and exotic. But there's a problem with this way of thinking. If Debussy didn't change his course, if he was already set on that course, then the implication is that his style would have developed that way whether or not he'd encountered the gamelan. So why are we talking about influence at all? 
surely what we want to say is that the encounter with the gamelan did change Debussy's course, but that there was something in Debussy, his character, his milieu, his ways of musical thinking or hearing, something that enabled him to respond to the gamelan in the creative way that he did. So the idea of preparation is okay, but we need to find a better nuanced way of thinking about it, and that's what I'm trying to do in this paper. <sighs> Enclosed within this larger argument, however, is one that has to do with the way the various notated sources relevant to Debussy's encounter with the government have been interpreted. In the chapter from which I'm extracting this paper, I make the argument through critique of an article from 1986 by Richard Mueller. Uh, it was the first article to be based on almost, though not quite, all of the relevant sources. And in essence, Mueller's approach is to look for what he calls common elements between Debussy's music and the Gamelan sources, into valic or rhythmic motifs that make sense within either cultural system, and hence that can act as points of contact between them. However, I complain in my, article, in my chapter that he approaches notations with the mindset of a modernist music theorist. He sees them as, in essence, specifications of structure. And for that reason, he gives insufficient attention to the quite different ways in which notations may be said to represent music, and hence to signify. Now, I'm not going to talk about Muller's uh, article today, but I am going to spend quite some in this paper talking about the different ways in which and the different purposes for which a number of the key sources represented Japanese music as heard in Paris during the closing years of the 19th century. Only after that will I move on to the question of what enabled Debussy to respond to the government in the way it did. Now, most of the literature about Debussy and the Gamelan focuses on his first encounter with Japanese music at the 1889 Exposition Universelle. The starting point has to be Robert Godet's account, admittedly written 37 years later, according to which Debussy spent extremely fruitful hours in the Campon Javanais of the Dutch section, where he went countless times attentive to the polyrhythmic percussion of a gamelan that proved itself inexhaustible in its combination of ethereal or glittering timbres, while the famous Bedaya's dance turning music into images. Now, by Bedaya's, Godet is referring to the four teenage dancers named Wakiem, Seriem, Tamina, and Sokia who, as Fazer puts it, ignited the fantasies of the Paris audiences. So they became media sensations off stage with newspapers reporting their attendance at concerts or theatrical performances. The Exposition featured exhibits from a wide range of European colonies, with the Japanese one consisting of a village at the edge of the Exposition compound, complete with villagers carrying out such traditional activities as weaving and carving. <coughs> An uncle ensemble guided visitors to a pavilion where refreshments were served. <coughs> and then the teenage dancers performed two dances to the accompaniment of a small gamelan ensemble, which incidentally was played by the same musicians who played the uncle. This was followed by a theatricalized social dance, staging flirtatious encounters between a Sudanese teenage dancing girl and an unidentified male dancer, before the musicians picked up their unplug again and escorted the spectators outside to empty the theater for the next show. <coughs> Now, the international exhibitions of the last decades of the 19th century generally served, uh, shared a common physical layout. Contemporary Western civilization was placed at the center, while traditional, mainly colonized cultures, seen as representing earlier stages of human development, were placed on the peripheries. The Gamelan scholar Henry Spiller says of the World's Columbian Exhibition, which took place in Chicago four years later, that 
American engagement with the Chava village, the Chicago Chava village, was essentially voyeuristic, and there's no reason to think that things were much different in Paris. But as regards the music, the, there's a further factor that came into play. At Amsterdam in 1883, at Paris in 1889, and Chicago in 1893. In all of these places, the Javanese exhibits were commercial ventures. They were funded by plantation owners, and they were designed to boost exports of their tea and coffee. Moreover, at all three exhibitions, the villagers, including the Gamelan musicians, were from the same plantation, Parakasalek in West Java, part of the former kingdom of Sunda. This means that, as the Gamelan scholar Suma Sum writes, the possibility of the performances of, at the Paris Exposition and the Chicago's World Fair being the same cannot be ruled out. And there's a reason I've told you this. Uh, the reason is it gives me an excuse to play you a short extract from a very early cylinder recording of the Gam uh, uh, cylinder recording of the Gamelan at the 1893 Chicago Fair, which was made by Benjamin Gilman. Don't expect too much of the sound. But even if it isn't likely that what's on this recording is the same music that Debussy heard in Paris, uh, and I won't be referring to it, but it's quite possible that you're actually hearing the very same musicians that Debussy heard. So it's worth describes the first of the notated sources that I referred to, a series of illustrated articles by Julien Tierso as ethnomusicological in nature. And at least on a straight reading, there's good reason for this. For one thing, Tierso represents his aim as to transcribe specific examples of what the Javanese musicians played. He prefaces his transcriptions with the caution that the scales of Japanese gamelan music cannot be directly translated into Western staff notation, and having said that, he goes on to do precisely that. Like everyone else, he uses the anhemitonic pentatonic scale, that is the black note scale, as the best available approximation to the Sundanese slender gamelan that was played at the exposition. But What's revealing is Tiarso's explanation of the difficulties that he encountered in making his transcriptions. Having gained some familiarity with the musical style, he explained, he thought he'd be able to take down some of the most interesting passages in real time, but it proved impossible. Instead, he had to come back out of ours and have the, music, the musicians play specifically for him, I assume in discrete sections, much as he presents his music. Tierzo also explains that he spent a lot of hours in discussion with the musicians, in what languages appear, and he even sat among them on the stage for a whole day, uh, as he puts it, studying the proceedings, observing the combinations of sounds, and making myself as Javanese as I could. But despite the element of identification with the exotic other that's implied by that last remark, Tierso represents his aim as, in essence, scientific. He was concerned not so much with reproducing the music's effect as with representing its note-to-note -note progress in a form that would, in an ideal world, be identical to how some other equally qualified Western musician might transcribe. Given the problems which Tierso complained, it's worth noting that Louis Benedictus, a former pupil of Liszt, who's nowadays 
better remembered as Judith Gautier's long-term lover than as a minor composer. Benedictus was famous for his exceptional musical memory. Uh, and the differences don't stop there. Chiasso's relatively scholarly articles collected into book form initially came out separately in Le Ménestral. By contrast, Benedictus's late music bizarre and exhibition was targeted at those who attended the exposition's exotic musical events and wanted a souvenir. The arrangements are technically undemanding, and the booklet was evidently a rushed job being published in August 1889, when the exposition had been open barely two months and it still had four months to go. So there were four months of sales. A crucial feature of Benedictus's representation of the gamelan music, which is simply uh, labeled Dons Chavonais, is signaled by scholarly disagreement as to what repertory item it actually represents. So, Muller assumes it to be a piece called Vani Vani that plays a major role in his article. Fauser objects that there's no evidence for this and instead regards it as a version of the same untitled piece that was transcribed by Tierso. And in support of this, she points out that Benedictus's and Tierso's transcriptions reveal strong similarities, including their melodic intervals, 16th note ornaments, a shift from duplets to triplets, and a gradual increase in rhythmic complexity and registral spread. The features that Fauser uh, identifies as shared by Benedictus and Tierso's transcriptions are very general characteristics. It's true there's one striking similarity between the two notations, the repeated notes in sextuplets, pairs and triplets, with which the major sections end. So you can see that at the end of this page from Benedictus, and you can see it at the end of this page from Tierso. But the significance of this is undermined by the fact that, as Tierso put it, one of the rhythmic procedures favored by the Javanese consists of repeating important notes in sextuplets. Practically all of their melodic phrases end with repetition of the final notes in this rhythm, and indeed that largely remains the case today. Then there's another problem. I said that uh, I, I said that the musicians who, who played both Anklung and Gamelan instruments were Sudanese, that's to say, from West Java, as were the instruments that they played. In contrast, the four dancers came from the court of Mankunagaran in Surakarta, otherwise known as Solo. In other words, they came from Central Java. Now, the relevance of this is that the Central Javanese and the Sundanese musical traditions are different in a number of key respects, and that poses an obvious problem. <coughs> <coughs> As Suvarsam says, how could Javanese musicians accompany Javanese uh, Sundanese? Uh, let's get this right. How could Sundanese musicians accompany Javanese dancers? What dances did the four court dancers perform? Did the gamelan group also perform Javanese gamelan repertoire? In other words, what did the visitors to the exposition actually hear and see? And for more than ten pages, some of some gravel, gra grapples with these questions, engaging with Müller's and Fauser's and other hypothetical explanations. He quotes Fauser's suggestion that trading relationships and intermarriages meant that music of either origin was known in the other province and that musicians are fluent in both styles, but he's clearly unconvinced. Halfway through the discussion, he notes the odd form of Benedictus as well as Chabonais and suggests that, if anything, it might be a reflection of a particular gamelan piece composed in a compact structure. And six pages later, he unpacks his, if anything, now speaking of Gilded Cylinder recordings from Chicago, when he suggests that what was being played was simplified versions of music drawn from a mixture of different genres. So the suggestion is that this was a 19th century forerunner of those programs of so-called traditional music and dance that you find today across the world's tourist destinations, which bundle together items drawn from different contexts and present them as a more or less fictitious national tradition. And this fits in with the fact that performers from the same places, quite possibly the same performers, performed as a, at a succession of world's fairs, perhaps developing a routine that was quite different from what they would play or dance at home. If that's the case, then 
all of these complicated scholarly attempts to match what was heard against specific items of traditional repertory are totally beside the point. Contrary to Benedictus in his Music Bizarre and Expedicio, uh, Fauzer writes, Debussy did not transcribe the music he heard into an immediately referential piece. Rather, he appropriated structural concepts and compositional procedures from his exposure to the gamelan. Uh, yeah. Well, I'd argue that all of that applies at least as much to Benedictus as it does to Debussy. It's true that the title page of Les Musiques Bizarre claims that the music is collected and transcribed by Benedictus, but you have to take that with a pinch of salt. As François Picard has shown, the eighth item in Benedictus's collection, a Marche Chinoise entitled Les Autres du Général, is actually an arranged and slightly tweaked version of a Chinese score transcribed and disseminated in 1776 by Joseph Marie Amio. So he presented it as something he heard. He didn't hear it at all. He copied it out of another book. So I think it's actually quite reasonable to suggest that we should think of Benedictus's 82 bar composition not as the transcription of a specific repertory item at all, but rather as a recreation in terms of late 19th century musical conventions of the alien sound world of Java as reflected in the cup on Java. Now, writing about the 1893 Chicago exhibition based on contemporary transcriptions, compositions designed to evoke the Javanese village and the newspaper reports, Henry Spiller identifies five characteristics of Javanese music that repeatedly appear in all of these sources. So they are the rich, complex, non harmonic timbres of the bronze and bamboo instruments themselves, which are sometimes interpreted as harmony. The formulaic nature of melodies and elaborations, a stratified polyphonic texture, a formal framework marked off by the parts played of low pitched gongs, going gongs, and a tendency towards ostinato and repetition. Even those Chicago sources that purport to be transcriptions, better argues, are not literal representations of what were played. Rather, they're recreations of what was heard, generated through the application of these various principles. And they suggest that Javanese music was heard much the same in Paris as it was in Chicago, for all of Spinner's features map well to Benedictus's Don Chavanais. And Fauzer is also thinking along the same lines when she writes that Benedictus' composition emphasizes those traits of gamelan music to which newspaper accounts drew their readers' attention, such as the slow build-up of the dynamic curve, the abrupt and unprepared ending of the piece on La Fortissima piece, the psychic structure of gamelan music, the percussive quality, and the increasing density of the texture. I mean, it's just worth remembering the word recordings in these days. So basically, you were working from memory. It's a completely different kind of thing from what would happen if you were transcribing the studies. But as with Spiller's five characteristics, these apply to gamelan music in general, rather than to one piece in particular. As I see it, Benedictus isn't representing Javanese music in the blow-by-blow -blow manner that Tierso attempted to represent it, but rather he was attempting to represent his experience of hearing it. Just to give one specific example, the half note D sharp C sharp ostinato that persists in the left hand throughout much of Benedictus's piece can hardly be seen as the transcription of some particular balonga. It's a stripped down, it's stripped down into a sign. It's a shorthand signifier of the balonga. So, speaking of such signifiers may make the Dolce Chavonais sound more like a characteristic product of 19th century French exoticism, made up of an established lexicon of signifiers for alterity, than it actually is. Considered as uh, late 19th century French music, 
Benedictus's piece is erratic, even defective. And I take this to be evidence of a negotiation between musical self and other. He allowed the impact of the musical other to significantly deform or reconstruct the conventions of his style, the common practice style. Benedictus's piece is black note pentatonic throughout, which is what you might expect of an orientalizing composition intended for amateur pianists. But its scalar organization is more structured than that might suggest. F sharp appears only in the melody of the introductory section you can see in bar four. This is perhaps intended to represent the Rembrandt or Indonesian violin, which not only characteristically initiates gamelan performances, but also makes use of outer scale notes. As for A sharp, this appears only in the opening phrase, you can see in the third bar, and in one later section, where it complements the dynamic and textural builder. The rest of the piece, and this is page two, consists of just three pitch classes, G sharp, C sharp, and D sharp. And this radical simplification of tonal material is basic to the way that Benedictus's piece works. In essence, C sharp serves as a kind of intoning note with short rhythmically driven melodic ideas, turning on the contrasts between the C sharp and on the one hand, the D sharp above it, and on the other hand, the G sharps both above and below it. So at one level, these pictures form the skeleton for two bar phrases that are sometimes linked through antecedent consequent relations into larger phrases. And this creates a pattern of succession that's not so very different from that of a dance form by Chopin Mazurker, but without a trace of conventional contextual motion. At another level, these pictures form into motifs that can be treated through imitation or even through something like liquidation. You can see both of those in the first four bars of this page. And the stripped out pitch content can be seen as maximizing the possibility of intersection between the cultural systems of gamelan music and of Western common practice. In this way, representing the kind of common elements that we were always looking for. There's never been a commercial recording of Benedictus's 1889 Don Chavanes, and so here's the first part of it performed by my ex doctoral student, Sheila Dwyer. <laughs> less beautifully. Remember, it was designed for amateur pianists taking it home and probably playing it very badly, and I think that's how it should be played. Now, I think that what you've heard supports uh, Fauser's claim that Benedictus cre created a representation of the sonic surface, offering some approximation to the timbral experience of the gamelan performance and mirroring the static, unpredictable, and cyclic nature of the music that accompanied the dancers, while echoing the faintly familiar melodic fragments of performance. But I go a stage beyond that. 
As a score intended for domestic performance, the Danse Japonaise prescribes or choreographs a series of real-time embodied practices, building on the standard skill set of amateur pianists, but at the same time defamiliarizing it. Played entirely on the black notes, for the most part restricted to just three pitch classes, and demanding that the sustaining pedal be depressed throughout, which certainly wasn't the case of Schiller's uh, recording. The score undermines the familiar topography of the piano, as well as the norms of classical piano performance. Fazer continues that, uh, that uh, Benedictus's transcription permitted his audience to take a small part of sonic memory of the Javanese spectacle back to the Parisian and provincial salons and drawing rooms at a time when recordings were not yet an alternative. I'd add that it also permitted a, an act of performative identification with the other of however burlesque a kind, comparable perhaps to blackface and minstrelsy. By buying Benedictus's little album, you could do what the so tried to do. For a few minutes, you could become Javanese. In her book, Fauzer traces Javanese influences in Debussy's piano music in the decade before the 1889 exposition. But the piano and orchestral music on which writers such as uh, Howard and Cook focus dates from the 1900s, in view of which it's strange that there is so much critical emphasis on Debussy's earlier encounter with the Gamelan, rather than the one that took place 11 years later at the 1900 Exposition Universelle. Again, Godet tells us that Debussy attended, and as in 1889, so in 1900, Benedictus composed a dulce Chavonaise. Once more, this appeared in a publication entitled Les Musiques Bizarres de l'Exposition. But this time, it's Judith Gautier, whose name is given as the author. As you can see, the title page does add transcript by Benedictus, transcribed by Benedictus, but it's in smaller print. The section on Japanese music begins with Gautier's reminiscences of the four dancers from 1889. Of all the marvels on display at that exposition, she says, the best remembered is the strange, that's bizarre, and seductive vision of those frail dancers. She describes the instruments of the gamelan, she speculates on their ancient Chinese origins, she briefly describes her performance, and she said there's no point in attempting to describe the music, as Monsieur Benedictus has realized a tour de force capturing this uncapturable music, which is never written down, in flight, fixing it and so conveying it to perfection, its cap uh, so conveying to perfection its captivating charm with its crystalline, yet as it were, liquid harmony. Well, at first glance, Benedictus's 1900 Dolce Javanese, which at 57 bars is a little shorter than the 1889 one, at first glance it resembles one of Chiefs's transcriptions. An obvious reason for this is the identification in the score of the various gamelan instruments on their first appearance, which immediately suggests a more ethnographic orientation, and the opening texture is plausible enough with the left hand playing a five note balungan figure. D, E, B, D, B in half notes, combined with a quarter note counterpoint in the right hand. This time, Benedictus consistently employs the anhematonic pentatonic scale rather than a subset of it, but as in the 1889 Dolce Chavonese, he avoids obvious tonal interpretation, particularly in potential contexts. And again, as in 1889, the main cadence is unlocked by repeated sextant. The treatment of these various elements, however, is such that the 1990 Dolce Javanese is more readily interpreted as a Western composition in exotic clothing than its counterpart of 11 years earlier. It takes the form of two main sections, respectively 16 and 34 bars, preceded by a seven-bar introduction in which the five-note Balongan figure appears twice, beginning the second time on the second beat of the bar, and that militates against any clear sense of periodicity based on the bar line, and gives the opening a sort of quite authentically exploratory quality. In short, as in the case of Benedictus's 1889, Dolce Javanese, it's quite possible to imagine distant echoes of the gamelan through his piano score, and to that extent to hear it as gamelan music. Like the, like the 1889 Dolce Chavanet, the 1900 one has never been commercially recorded, so I'll play the introduction and the first main section 
again performed by a ship climber. underlying Benedictus as the depiction of the gamelan come into evidence. In the 1889 Don Chabonnet's Benedictus created an effect of direction in a manner that is at least some parallel with Japanese practices. Uh, through large-scale increases in dynamics, rhythmic activity, and texture density. In 1900, he adopts an approach that's much more characteristic of Western music from the 18th century on, the manipulation of phrase length. The first main section of the composition begins with four-bar phrasing, uh, with the beginnings of the phrases aligned with the five-note Balungan figure, which in this way is used rather in the manner of a classical theme. The patterns of repetition then define phrases whose lengths decrease geometrically from four bars to two to one and a half, uh, from two to one to a half. In short, the Balonga figure is not only liquidated, but it's been liquidated in a thoroughly Western manner. And there are other aspects of Western motivic technique too. While the principal motif is what I've been calling the Balonga figure, there are a number of subsidiary but still distinctive motifs. And without going into details, they appear sometimes complete and sometimes fragmented in a kind of application of Beethoven, Beethovenian motivic technique to these exotic materials. Now, to make the point about this strange intersection of Beethoven and Gamelan music, I want you to try a rather extreme thought experiment. Instead of imagining the opening <coughs> bars of Benedictus's score as Gamelan music, try imagining them as the transcription of a late Beethoven quartet. Okay, in a quartet context, we'd surely identify this as a conscious throwback to Baroque feudal style with a minimum subject and a quaver counter subject. Equally reminiscent of the tradition of strict counterpoint as Benedictus is used later in the piece of rhythmic diminution and augmentation. All of this might be again understood in terms of Muller's common elements. Benedictus is building on the suggestions in Gamelan music of periodic phrasing, motivic recurrence, and traditional counterpoint, using these as a structural basis for his own dance Or to put it another way, Benedictus has seized on a number of stylistic elements that he heard in Gamelan music, taking them out of their original context, and instead systematizing them according to an essentially Western notion of what composition is. It's a more thoroughgoing example of the same kind of generative process that Spinner described in the Chicago transcriptions from 1893. To that extent, both Benedictus and Jean-Dance Javanais can be seen as examples of transcultural composition to the extent that they seek to accommodate the other within the representational format of the self. But they demonstrate in what very different ways and to what very different effects this can be done. And the combination of Benedictus's two representations of gamelan music provides a good basis for an assessment of the first of Debussy's overtly Javanese pieces, Pagode, the first of his Eston. It was composed three years later after his second encounter with the Gamelan in 1903.
none. Unlike in the cases of Tiamso and Benedictus, nobody thinks to ask what particular repertory item might be reflected in Pagode. You don't expect to be simply doing that. But actually, perhaps people should wonder about that. Like Benedictus in 1889, Debussy bases his piece on a black note pentatonic scale. And the most characteristic and consistent feature of Debussy's pentatonically amorphous melodies is the C sharp, uh, G sharp, C sharp, D sharp motif with which the majority of them begin. That's not only the same three pitch classes from which most of Benedictus's 1889 Dolce Javanese is constructed, but it's the same form in which its principal melodic material was first introduced. So an obvious question arises, <coughs> to which I haven't yet found an answer, whether Debussy knew Benedictus's Dolce Javanese and to what extent it may have conditioned his response to the gamma. Be that as it may, because I don't know, the comparison with Benedictus's fragmentary and repetitive melodies underscores a much more conventional quality of Debussy's opening melody for bar three, which exemplifies the kind of languid arabesque it already served for, deep, for decades as an all-purpose signifier of the orient, of the exotic. And in the same way, the pentatonic elements of Pagode have been absorbed into a broader turn-of-the-century tonal vocabulary. From the start, Debussy treats his black note pentatonic scale as an added sixth chord on B. He affects the A sharp of his B major key signature to end natural in order to hint at a subdominant inflection. And he changes his balong unlike bass notes into quasi functional linear progressions. With a slight alteration, Debussy's quip about Le Sacre de Printemps would apply just as well to Picard. This is exotic music with every modern convenience. And I'll play you the first minute or two of a recording of Debussy's Pagode to get the sound in your ears. This recording dates from the 1970s, but by all accounts, it echoes on one pianist at least was playing it back in the 1920s. So the pianist in question is Erwin Nyerikirhazi. He likens the opening to the relationship between Kempul and Gong, the triplet figure at bar 11, to the rhythm and timbre of the Bonang, bar 37, to interlocking Gender, and sees the coda as a combination of high, rapidly moving, and low, slower metallophones, together with the Gong. 
But these are not so much imitations as schematized references. That's how it goes on to say. The piece is a picture and a stone, evoking a Westerner's perception of another continent, culture, climate, atmosphere, and way of life, a way of life. One moreover in which Debussy had no personal experience, as his use of the title Pagode possibly betrays. I do have a learned footnote here. Yes, there are no uh, pagodas in Java, but the term pagoda was used in contemporary blah 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 and so on and so on. You won't know that. In other words, the music creates an image of one culture within the terms of another culture. And without the defamation or reconstruction of the musical self that I noted in the case of Benedictus. The fact that Pagode can be described by Paul Roberts as a piece that closely imitates the Japanese gamelan, or by Richard Fried as a more or less direct representation of the gamelan sounds in keyboard terms, neither of which can possibly be seen as in any literal sense true. The fact that they can say this only shows the extent to which these references have been naturalized within Western conventions. So it's really hard to quarrel with Fauser's conclusion, through which he seems to come to the modernist interpretation of Debussy as an agent of rupture, that his appropriation of elements from the exotic performances to further the cause of French music is as much part of the colonial enterprise as what we habitually identify in works such as Lacme, and Lacme is a particularly famous orientalizing opera by Delis. And as a matter of fact, you might have guessed this sort of exoticizing impulse uh, just as much from Debussy's essentializing characterization of the, night, uh, of the Japanese in 1913 when he called them wonderful people to learn music as easily as one learns to breathe. Their school consists of the eternal rhythm of the sea, the wind of the leaves, and a thousand other tiny noises which they listen to with great care without having ever, ever consulted any of those dubious treatises. Just as Pagot just as in Pagode, Debussy perhaps drew on Benedictus, so he perhaps drew on Judith Gautier, because there's a distinct echo in Debussy's evocative words of her description of the Javanese music of the 1889 Exposition, which was published a few weeks after it opened. She spoke of whisperings and murmurs, the rustling of a tree in the wind, the raindrops, nothing to the sounds of nature. On both sides of the Atlantic, the Javanese villages at successive exposition prompted images of the Javanese as untouched children of nature, more like dolls than adults. Writing of the Javanese village at Chicago, Richard Harding Davis spoke of the little people so like children masquerading in grown-up people's clothes, while Caroline Kirkland spoke of the Java village with its houses and industries straight from the South Seas, the South Seas and its exquisite, tiny women, dainty as porcelain. Well, at this point, some kind of reality check might be in order. The haunting image of a Parisian encounter of two hitherto unrelated worlds is completely misleading in musical as in other terms. As soon as some explains, under the Dutch colonial system, there was widespread dissemination of European music in Java, not only within the large mixed race community, but among the Javanese aristocracy. European popular music became a strand in the elite culture of Java, and the Mancuna Garan court, from which you remember the teenage dancers came, was particularly noted for its take up of European social dancing. So despite being seen as paradigms of exotic alterity, Wakiem, Seriem, Tamina, and Sokia came from an environment in which European music was not only known, but well integrated into colonial society. Okay, so this is the point where I come back to the question I posed in the introduction to this paper. What enabled Debussy to respond to the gamelan in the way that he did? If Howard is right in calling Debussy's encounter with the gamelan a focal point of oriental influence in Western art, well, that's not simply because of the composer's immediate fascination with the sounds that he received at the Campagne Chavonnet. It's not because of the portrait and tones that Ralph Lott, as Ralph Lott pulls it, that he created in the go. 
It's because of the longer term process through which elements suggested by or abstracted from Javanese music infused themselves as part of Debussy's normal technique, became part of his own style, his compositional persona. So we can't answer the question of what enabled Debussy to respond in the way he did by simply reading something off the score. As Mark Perlman says, another uh, Gamelin scholar, it's never possible to extract concepts directly from a musical practice. Influence, in the sense that Howard intends the term, involves a changed way of thinking about music, or more accurately expressed, it involves a transformation in the conceptual schema that are involved in composition. The crucial question then is how such a transformation took place. So to trace it back a further step, how Debussy was able to hear the gamelan in such a way that he could assimilate it compositionally. And I'm going to suggest one specific answer, which I can ex best explain by focusing on a familiar element of Debussy's latest style that's adumbrated in his pagode and commonly attributed to his encounter with the gamelan. And this is his habit of composing a superimposed rhythmic strata with a tendency for the higher notes to move faster than the lower notes. We've already seen one example of this, how its comparison between various passages from Bergaud and the pa patterns of rhythmic interlocking characteristic of gamelan music that I cited a few minutes ago. Uh, this both illustrates Debussy's use of rhythmic layers and makes the case for a specific association with the gamelan. But the opening of Clasha Traven et Fui from the second set of Image, oops, from the second set of Image, and dating from four years later, is a more developed and again commonly cited example. Howard points out that the rhythmic relationship between the A's and the two, two lower staves of bars three to four uh, from Clasha Traven et Fui exactly matches that between Ketuk and Kenong, but the point is a rhythmic stratification no longer has a specifically exotic association. On the contrary, the three lights, the three stay format places Clochard Travelle et Feuille within a tradition of 19th century pianistic virtuosity, while such well-known orchestral examples of rhythmic layering as Ronde de Printemps from the orchestral image, and in particular the late ballet score might be seen as prefiguring later developments, including, for example, Ligeti's micro. But if the rhythmic stratification of the opening of Clochard et Fouille represents an aspect of gamelan music, it also resembles another musical practice that I hinted of when I spoke at, of Beethoven's late quartets. It is a practice with which Debussy was already extremely familiar as a consequence of his conservatory training. This is Species Counterpoint, which was taught at the Paris Conservatoire on the basis of the Cours de Contemporain et de Fugue, authored by a distinguished former director, Louis Carabini. That's the source of the example you're looking at. Looking beyond the immediate contrast between the music of the telephone ensemble and the pedagogical genre based on idealized voices, the relationship between gamelan music and species counterpoint is a mixture of total opposition and striking similarity. Well, the differences are obvious. There's the principle of heterophony or simultaneous variation that's built into gamelan music and that is as different as could possibly be from the independence of voices that lies at the heart of species counterpoint. Another difference is that in species counterpoint, there's no equivalent to the colotomic, that's to say rhythmically nested, organization of gamelan music. But then equally obvious is the parallel between the textual layers of gamelan music and those of species counterpoint, defined in each case by successive relationships of rhythmic diminution. Cherso himself made the comparison between gamelan and early music. As he said, aren't the curious similarities to be drawn between the procedures of Japanese music and those of our Western polyphony from the 15th and 16th centuries? The part of the rebab is like the cantus firmus from a messe de l'armade, or a polyphonic song by one of the masters of that time. The variously elaborated patterns of the other instruments of the gamelan are counterpoints which, while not having the stability of those of Josquin de Pré or Palestrina, 
evidently proceed from exactly the same principle. So he is thinking about what is formalized as species conjugal. And the same idea made its way into the writings of the first generation of ethnomusicologists to work in Japanese music. Yap Kunst used the term cantus firmus to describe the balunga, and Suvasan has traced it further back than that. Even Debussy associated the gamelan with early, earlier music. Based on Goddard's account, Fauser suggests that the multi layered contrapuntal quality of the gamelan seemed, seemed to Debussy to be a musical device that the composer tried to relate to the canon of Western counterpoint through Haydn's study of Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, at first sight, it might appear really quite perverse to associate the notoriously anti-academic Debussy with his contempt for pedagogical rules and regulations with, of all things, the species counterpoint. But actually, that is just the point. A month before the 1889 Exposition opened, Debussy told his former teacher, Ernest Guiho, that I don't write in the Pugel style because I know it. He knew it backwards. He'd been through the conservatory. And it goes further than that. Palestrina is singled out in Carabina's Quote de Contrecoi as a representative, representative of the most classical composers. In fact, he's the only composer in the Quote de Contrecoi other than Carabini himself whose music is included. And that gives a particularly sharp point to the obviously provocative play that Ducey makes after his remarks about the school of the internal rhythms of the sea and the dubious treatises. So in his music, he said, obeys laws of counterpoint that make Palestrina seem like child's play. Seen this way, it's the possibility of mapping the rhythmic layerings of gamelan music onto the already deeply internalized schema of species counterpoint that provides the key to Debussy's ability to respond to the gamelan as he did. It enabled him to hear gamelan music not simply as the music of a cultural other, as something appealingly exotic but irreducibly foreign. It enabled him to hear the music of the other as, in some sense, his own music, and in this way, to make it its own. There's an obvious way to which to model this, which is through the idea of conceptual blending, conceptual blending theory. So we would say that the features or configurations shared by gamelan music and species counterpoint, you know, common elements, enable an alignment of the conceptual spaces of Japanese and of European music, and hence a cross-flow of qualities between them. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of conceptual blending theory for now, but I'll mention one crucial idea that comes out of conceptual blending theory. And that's that the cross-flow of qualities that results, the, the cross-flow of qualities results in an experience that is emergent in the sense that it isn't simply the combinations of the qualities that feed into it, but rather it's a transformation of it. The effect of Debussy's rhythmic layering, whether in his music for piano or for orchestra, is nothing like species counterpoint, and only like that of the gamelan in the broadest and loosest sense. It's something essentially new. And actually, it takes a pianist to probably describe what is new about it. Howard suggests that for Debussy, the basic problem with the piano is its essentially percussive nature, at odds with the same sound of wind or string instruments or the voice. In Pagode, Howard continues, Debussy, for the first time, completely accepts this percussiveness as it is and carries his musical lines by turning it into a carpet of sound in exactly the same way as a gamelan does. A paragraph later, he refers to bringing from chords and textures the resonances of the strings and soundboard rather than the hits of the hammer. And again, he cites Pagode as an illustration. Paul Roberts, the pianist, hints at the same conception when he writes that Pagode requires a refined touch for creating a variety of simultaneous levels, and he emphasizes the physical dimensions of what's required in order to achieve the required effect. For the opening measures, he says, the arms and bodies should be perfectly poised with no movement except for the left hand 
coming over the right and in gentle arch as if reaching for a slightly brighter side of the goal. The physical gesture is as different as it could possibly be from the one that was choreographed by Benedictus's 1889 Charles Dominés. As different as is the sound. And on the next page, Roberts develops the gamelan analogy now with reference to bar three of Pago. Each melody note needs to have the same weight with the inner gongs, F sharp and G sharp, sounding together clearly audible. A gong has its own character, which is immutable once the sticks have been chosen. What Howard characterizes in terms of sound production and Roberts in terms of the choreographic, uh, choreographed performance of imaginary gongs is a conception of music as above all a phenomenon of resonance that Robert Schmitz, who studied with Debussy, was referring to when he wrote that the composer regarded the piano as the Balinese, he meant Javanese, regard their gamelan orchestras. He was interested not so much in the single tone that was obviously heard when a note was struck, as in the patterns of resonances which that tone set up around itself. Schmitz's formulation, which dates from 1937, is distinctly reminiscent of Christian Murray's insistence that composers do not or should not work with notes, but rather with sound and time. And in her book, The Spectral Piano, Marilyn Duncan traces the role of the overturned series in directing harmony from Pagode to Clochette Harbert, actually. Duncan also cites Schmitz, whom she follows referring to the shimmering microtonal sonorities of the Balinese gamelan. On, she, she, referred, she cites him on Debussy's insistence that the piano keys be struck in a peculiar way, otherwise the sympathetic vibrations of the other notes will not be heard quivering distinctly in the air. And she relates all of this to Debussy's possession of a blue piano with adequate stringing, the effect of which is the intensification of harmonic resonance. When I trace the progression from Bagode and Clocha Travel de Fouille to Je and Ligeti's micro polyphony, then I might easily have added spectral composition to the list. In this very Parisian narrative, Debussy is frequently invoked as a precursor of spectralism, and it's tempting to draw a parallel between how Debussy listened to the Camelot and how the spectralists listened to Debussy. To summarize it, through species counterpoint and no doubt other aspects of his musical experience, because I'm not trying to say it's all to do with species counterpoint, but I'm trying to use species counterpoint to set out a kind of conceptual model. Through species counterpoint and other things, then Debussy was prepared for the encounter with Javanese music, just as could Consuelo say. You might even say that the elements of the new style were already inherent in Debussy's old style, but the encounter played an essential role in prompting what was most definitely a change in direction. In line with Chow and Chong's formulation that I quoted before, the encounter with Javanese music was the catalyst that prompted Debussy to conflate the rhythmic layering of Caribbean's exercises with the small-scale repetitions of ostinata that were already part of his style, and so open up a new compositional direction with what proved to be extremely far-reaching consequences. And that's really it, but I do have just one final reflection. <coughs> After saying all of this, I still can't help feeling that there's something vulnerable about this long chain of argument involving his, his historically irre, involving historically irrecoverable cognitive processes that can never be more than hinted at by the surviving doctor. And there is a sense in which the influence of the Gamelan of Debussy exists most tangibly in the ongoing interpretation of his works, by which I mean not so much critical as performance interpretation. By his own account, Roberts is playing an imaginary Gamelan when he performs Debussy's piano music. An understanding of Pagoan and a technique for its execution will come from imagining and imitating the different modes of attack required for Gamelan. And he extends this principle beyond of exoticizing representation when he writes of Cloche à travers les feuilles that 
whether or not the piece is a conscious memory of the gambling, it can only profit if it appears to be aware of gambling pictures and sororities. But it's Howard from whom the most compelling testament comes. For many years, he tells us, he considered Pagode to be one of Debussy's less successful pieces. But after two years' experience of playing in a gambling himself, he came to understand no certain instructions in the score that had seemed problematic when interpreted in normal Western terms. These were now revealed as references to gambling music, and ironically, he adds, the key to making sense of them lay in strict adherence to the indications in Debussy's score. In this way, and irrespective of its status as historical fact, Debussy's encounter with the gamelan continues to be enacted on concert platforms throughout the world, more than a century after the Paris Exposition closed their doors for the last time. 